Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming for the next meeting of Warsaw Quantum Computing Group. It's great that there are so many people today. Uh, the lecture, Quantum Neural Networks, a Practical Approach, will be given by Professor Piotr Gavron. Uh, but before we start, uh, I would like to tell you that this event is supported by Daft Code and Central Net Dome Technology, and I would like to invite Tomek from CTT, who will tell you a bit about our venue. Hi, hello. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tomasz Piątek, and uh, I'm in charge of the educational program here at the Central Technology Hub. Uh, is any one of you actually uh, uh, been here before, or maybe a show of hands? And anyone? Oh, yeah, three. Okay, great. So four. Okay, I see you. <laughs> so we opened uh, at in, in August. So it's we are a pretty new institution. So. Just uh, three uh, quick sentences about what we do. So we are an educational institution, so we actually conduct uh, workshops about technology uh, for people of various age. So we don't have any, any course on uh, quantum uh, technology and quantum uh, information technology, let's say. We, uh, we rather try to explain to seven-year-olds what is uh, artificial intelligence, so that's like uh, another level. And the second main thing that we do, uh, so we have an exhibition which you can uh, see outside. It is actually quite an, an occasion because today is the first day of our new exhibition which will last uh, uh, till, uh, till July, I think. It is about the use of technology in education, how it can help us or how, uh, how, or how can we use technology to actually enhance our uh, education. And our third main uh, pillar, let's say, is uh, community. So it is uh, meetings like that and meetups like that. So we try to actually uh, make room for various meetings of people from various, let's say, backgrounds. So, so, so from uh, education, from business, from uh, academia, et cetera, et cetera, to just uh, provoke, let's say, various encounters to, uh, and maybe some, something nice will come out, uh, out of it. So uh, that's just a quick uh, few words about us. Uh, so have fun today, and thank you very much. OK, thanks, Tomek. And I think we can start, Piotr. So the floor is yours. OK, uh, okay so I, I wanted to, prepare, to present you today uh, a talk on quantum neural networks and in a practical way. So there will be some code, there will be some equations, of course, but not so many. And I will focus on, on a practical approach and how we, you can train your quantum neural networks uh, at home, of course, using simulators, which is what I show here, or maybe using real machines, but I don't really believe that um, we, we can achieve this, uh, we can do anything useful with real machines yet. But nevertheless, uh, my, my hope is that I, I could be able to, to at least show a pr proof of concept in some future how we can really do an anything useful with that. OK, so I work in AstroSand, uh, which is a, a unit in uh, Nikolaus Kopernikus Astronomical Center of Polish Academy of Sciences. And I will tell you a little bit more about AstroSand later, because we have some open positions and ideas, and if you want to join us, it is possible in var on various levels. OK, the, central, uh, the, the, the agenda of the talk is uh, as follows. We start with quantum machine learning with quantum circuits, some pictures. I will show you some pictures. An example in Python code. Then I will talk about uh, multi-class classification. I will discuss an experiment I, I, I did. Um, present a summary and some bibliography. So there are some papers you definitely should read if you want to learn more about this subject. OK, so these slides are presented. Uh, I mean, the pictures were, were done by Xanadu AI, one of the leading uh, enterprises in this field. Um, and it is based on the Penny Lane, on the Penny Lane library and documentation of this library uh, that they written. Uh, it's a very nice library that has some flowbacks, but uh, drawbacks. But it's uh, it's a very good source of uh, information about this subject. So, first of all, what is this picture supposed to present? It is a an idea of a neural network having classical and uh, so the okay the, the classical and quantum nodes. 
Uh, a classical node is basically a routine, a computational routine that uh, we, we can use in any kind of neural network. So it can be a dense layer, a convolutional layer, uh, some kind of uh, recurrent, uh, recurrent uh, uh, layer, whatever. Basically, you, can you want to imagine here. And in technical terms, it can be a node that is a that is a tensor, uh, TensorFlow node or a node uh, uh, that is uh, 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 written in PyTorch, whatever you want. Then there are quantum nodes. Quantum nodes basically are representation of, uh, of quantum devices. A quantum node, node takes some data, x, and produces some result, f of x, with some parameters, theta. X is our input, this classical input, is our classical data. Uh, theta is a set of parameters that parameterizes our quantum circuit, and, X, uh, and f of x of theta is basically a real number. How this real number will, uh, can be computed? So we start, as usual, in, in quantum computation with a state zero, you can see at the bottom here. Then we apply some unitary transformation that is dependent of x and theta, and then we perform a measurement. And the result somehow connected to this measurement is understood as our value of our function. OK, so that's basically what I already told you. We have x and theta, then we put in our quantum node, which is an abstract idea, and we calculate the value f of x theta. And of course, we have this quantum device that realizes, realizes this, uh, these operations. And in uh, our particular case, it can be either a simulator, of course, a quantum computer uh, pro being programmed by whatever uh, library you like, quantum programming library you like. It can be QAs kit. It can be uh, uh, the, the, the one uh, uh, forest, yeah, irrigative forest, or anything you basically want because there are various plugins in plain pen lane to these libraries, and you can use any quantum device you wish. Or it can be an optical uh, device that is produced by Xanadu. And this optical device is not based on, uh, on qubits, but based on optical modes on, upon, about which I don't really know anything, and you need to have, uh, uh, have people from, from opt quantum optics to tell you more about it. OK. What is important here, that in some circumstances, in cases which are useful for us, we can calculate gradient of our function f of x theta. And it can be done in an efficient, symbolic way. In what sense? In this sense that uh, what you see there that a quantum node, if, if we want to use this quantum node and we want to cal calculate the gradient of our function, we just have to run two programs, two quantum programs on the quantum device with slightly varying the parameter, parameter theta, plus s or minus s, where s is large. And in that way, and com by computing the difference, we can compute the, uh, the gradient which is important because we don't estimate it approximately. We do it uh, as well as our ability to sample um, the values of observables from our quantum computer. OK, so, so, so a little bit of mathematics here. So basically, you should read the paper by Maya Schrute et al. So basically, the papers by Maya Schrute are important here. She is the, the main leader in this, in this field. Uh, how it is uh, computed. By, basically, the idea is as follows. If you have a function, which is an expectation value of, a, of an observable O in, state, in some state, basically, depending on a unitary operation parameterized by, uh, by, by a number me, and if this unitary is generated by, by a Hermitian operator that has two distinctive eigenvalues, this function has the, the gradient here. You can see on the, 
uh, here. So, and we know the value of R, which is the eigenvalue, and we know the value of S, which is dependent on the eigenvalue. So we can efficiently compute the gradient uh, by, from this formula, which is great. For example, if we have a rotation Rx, which is uh, defined as, as follows, the value of, uh, S is, uh, of R is uh, 1 over 2, of course, and the value of, uh, of s is then p over 2, pi over 2. And we can compu compute the gradient. So when you, we can compute the gradient from, um, for this neural network, we can do, let me return here, back propagation from, of this network. We, can, we know how to compute numerically the gradients of classical functions, our classical boxes, but also of this quantum box. So we can perform forward computation by evaluating the value of a, of a function given, uh, given data, given parameters. And we know how to vary the parameters theta in order to minimize our cost function. It allows us to build hybrid quantum classical neural network. OK. Here is an example of a variational algorithm, which is basically uh, the, the basic idea behind these quantum nodes. Imagine that you have a, a task. You want to minimize, OK, what you, have, you are given? You are given an initial quantum state, 0, known. You are given two parameterized rotation, R, Rx, Rx, Ry. You are also given some, OK, it's not really important, but phi1, phi2, initial phi2, phi1, phi2 is known. And your goal is to find such parameters of phi1, phi2 that the expectation value of observable sigma z is minimal. So basically, we want to find the, the, the label of the, 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 the eigenvalue minus 1. So we want to find the such, rotation, such parameters of these rotations that we want to change the state 0 to 1, cat 0 to cat 1. OK. I mean, we know how to do it. You can calculate. But you know, I, I, I'm an engineer. I don't really know how to calculate by hand. It's really, I, I don't really like this kind, of, this kind of calculation. So what we can do, we can write the program, a variational program here in Penny Lane. OK, what happens here? Of course, we want to, implement, uh, to, uh, to uh, import our, our, uh, our library. Then we want to import our optimizer, as in any uh, neural network uh, library. Then we define a quantum device uh, that consists of a single qubit. And then we create our circuit. So this is our circuit. Um, this circuit, of course, takes parameters, val, which is phi 1, phi 2, and applies operation Rx depending on phi 1 and Ry depending on phi 2. OK, that's var 0, var 1, because of usual mathematical and, and, and computer science notation, engineering notation. And then, of course, we measure the expectation value of operator val Vz. That's our secret. So now we initialize our optimizer, which in this case grade in the send optimizer with a learning rate 0. Uh, 25. We find some initial parameters and random at random, and they start performing optimization. So we use the circuit with the var uh, with the variables, and we update our var variables. So these parameters has to be have to be uh, minimized in several steps using 
this gradient descent optimization routine. Is it clear? <laughs> Does any head, anyone has pr trouble to follow it? So because we know the gradients, we can't, this, uh, basically this operation uh, here, I mean this, uh, uh, this, this, this magical function step knows how to cal calculate the gradients and now, knows how to minimize this, uh, this procedure in several steps. Okay, so now let's wait a little bit. I have a slide that uh, takes a little bit to, to, um, to load. Okay, so now we have three examples of three optimizers. Uh, the first one is just a naive gra gradient descent. The second one is nested of momentum optimizer, whatever it means. I mean, I will show you the, uh, the equation later, but it's not really important. And the third is Adam optimizer, which is fairly complicated. And we have an initial state, which is different from the, the, the one on the, on the previous uh, slide, but that's the initial, those are our initial guesses for the angles. And we can see that for these various optimizers, we have different trajectories that start from the blue arrow here and then end up in cat one state, which in my notation is, the, is associated with eigenvalue minus one, sorry. <laughs> Uh, but you can see that there are different, uh, different trajectories here, which is, first of all, interesting uh, to see this, this kind of uh, behavior. And I can tell you that I tried uh, uh, yet another optimizer that was unsuccessful in this limited number of steps here. I believe I did 200 or 500 steps. I don't re really remember. Uh, but the, one I, uh, the, the third one was very unsuc unsuccessful. But at least we can see that roughly we can find this, uh, this gate, parameters of this gate, that leads to value uh, of the uh, associated with eigenvalue minus one, or the state associated with eigenvalue minus one. Here we're slightly off, but yeah, with a couple of other additional steps we can find better, uh, better parameters. So it works. Okay, so we already know what is a variational circuit. Then we, we want to run an experiment. We want to have a, a neural network. So if we want to have an experiment in machine learning, we start with these flowers, of course. Uh, so of course I'm talking about the IRIS data set, which you probably all know if you work with uh, statistics of machine learning. And we have these three beautiful uh, uh, genius kinds? I, I don't really know. I'm not good. At, um, uh, I don't really know. But we have three kind of uh, flowers, species, I believe. Yeah, there are species. Not really sure. Uh, but uh, most likely are species. And we, what we have, we have two, uh, four features of these species: the width and the length of the petal. This this construction here, and the width and the length of the sepal. And we have some. Statistics. We can observe some statistics of this, uh, of this, um, uh, this width and length here. Okay, and of course we can have a nice well, scatter plot and observe these uh, these values here. So we can see that you know some of these uh, classes are separable. So this class is pretty well separable from others, but these two are difficult to separate. But basically. Uh, that's the structure of this data set. OK. So what we do now? In this first example, I will show you only two classes uh, and uh, all the four, four features. So in order to load our data to a quantum computer, in this scheme I, I use, we have to transform the values of the features into uh, angles zero, zero to pi. So basically, we do this uh, data preprocessing. We, we standardize the data so that each feature has minimal value of zero and maximal value of pi over all samples. And of course, these uh, scaling parameters are di different from different features. Why? Because we want to encode this data on 
uh, qubits. So we have, we have our sample vector here, x. We have our um, encoding gate that takes the vector x and the, the, the vector the x and, uh, and applies it on the, of the initial state of uh, zeros. And in fact, uh, applies these rotations, Rx. So we have every single individual feature of a sample, of a single sample, mapped to an angle. And we, have, we rotate the qubit uh, according to this angle. There are other ways to encode uh, features on a quantum computer. This one is a very simple one. It's elementary in the sense that we can do it in a, a very efficiently because it's a separable state. But unfortunately, we need as many qubits as features. There are other ways which take, well, which are way more complicated, but they encode a feature or vector on a logarithmic number of, uh, of qubits. So then it's interesting. So it scales logarithmically, so uh, it's uh, very efficient in the terms of uh, quantum memory. Unfortunately, the circuits to encode the data on, uh, on this, uh, in this logarithmic way are very long. So we exchanged the running time for the runtime for our uh, quantum encoding for quantum space. OK. So now we have the second gate, the variational gate. Uh, the variational gate is basically a guess. It's a ran in, a, in a sense, a random guess uh, that has any reasonable structure. In this case, we, we just have this structure that we have control not uh, operations between first, second qubit, second, third, uh, third, fourth, and then fourth, first in the first layer. In the second layer, we, we have the offset is of two. And in the third layer is offset of three, modulo four, of course. So, and we, have, we add these rotations. We have rotations, which are general qubit rotations with three parameters, three angles. And these angles, of course, are unknown. We want to learn them. Those are our weights of a, uh, of a layer of a quantum, uh, quantum neural network. So we have these angles, W, which is uh, uh, basically a, a tensor of data, n by 3 by L. And we want to learn these weights using variational approach. OK, so first we, ha we want to, uh, to define our decision function, um, which is a, a function from, of course, Rn, so from our feature space, to plus, minus 1. And we define this as follows. So we have f of x of theta. It is an expectation value of op obs uh, oper observable O in this, in this uh, st initial state 0, transformed by our encoding and variational circuits, plus a bias, a classical bias. So our decision function uh, consists of two parts. This one that is uh, calculated on quantum computer, and this one which is a classical value we add to our uh, to our to our layer, or our not layer actually, but our quantum neural network. And of course, expectation value is given here. So it is so basically this state psi, cat bra psi. Overla uh, overlapping the observation, uh, the uh, our um, observable O, and in my case, this observable O is just uh, the value of the measurement sigma z measurement on the first qubit, and I ignore all other qubits. That's the choice, of course. And then, of course, we want to introduce the classification function, which is basically the signal of the decision function. So we want to have values plus, minus, one. 
OK, training. So the data are divided into train, validation, and test set. Validation is not going to be used in this very example, but it is important for the next example. So I, I will leave this, uh, this version here. In, what, what I understand by train, validation, and test, because the language is uh, slightly complicated here or noisy. Train, it means the data we use to uh, calculate our weights. Validation set is the data that we use to decide when to stop training. And test set is the set, test, the set that we use in order to verify the quality of our classifier. So the test set is not used at all during the training, and the validation set you know, is, is somehow used in the training. So what do we do? We start with uh, our TTAS, uh, sorry, TTAS mm, from a, a uniform distribution of 0 to 1. Uh, our value b is chosen to be 0. We define a cost function, which is uh, basically um, the, OK, it's not really defined here, but it's basically a, a function, a square. It is a square of differences between um, labels, training labels, and the value of our, values of our decision function in batches. So this cost function is always calculated for a batch, for, for a subset. So a batch, is, OK, a batch is, is basically a, a couple of samples that we use to train our, uh, our classifier, as in traditional neural networks. And in, in each step of, uh, of the experiment, we calculate accuracy, which is basically the number of uh, right guesses of uh, our classifier for the validation step, for the validation set. And this accuracy is, uh, we use the accuracy in order to choose the best tetas over every single batch of a training, training step and as our best, uh, best uh, classification value. Oh, classifier parameters, sorry. Our cl best classifier parameters. Of course, we do it in order to uh, avoid overfitting. And we use a couple of optimizers. I already told you, gated, gated descent, which is basically this very simple optimizer that okay, has the initial value of theta in a, a given step time step t, and you has a learning rate eta, and of course uses uh, the gradient at time t of the, our function, our cost function here. Um, in order to decide what is the next step. And of course, we can use different uh, methods, classical methods of optimization, like nested of momentum optimizer that has some momentum, uh, which is a parameter, hyper, hyper parameter here, M, but it's not really so important. And with Adam, other grad optimizer, they have very complicated equations which are, we wouldn't fit on, the, on this simple slide, so it's not really important. We have, we can choose any optimizer we want, of course, depending on the data set, depending on, the, uh, on our structure of neural network, they can behave better or worse. It depends. We don't really know which of them will behave the best uh, given our structure of our problem. OK, so I wanted to show you an example. OK, there's this nice demo uh, presented by Entropy Labs. I don't know anything about them, that you can play with uh, online. Well, it's nice. Okay, so you have this, this circuit that has uh, here omegas are data, data points, these data points, omega 0, omega 1. And tetas are, of course, our parameters. So when I vary tetas, you can observe that, uh, sorry, uh, that our classification function values change. So this. And there's this uh, classical parameter uh, bias that basically cuts this function at different levels. And you can learn online, for example, which is nice. 
Okay, the accuracy here is not the the best. Okay, here is the best for the parameters they learn. And what you can do, you can change your sequence here, which is nice. Very, uh, let's say you can have different sequence. This one is pretty silly because parameters do not do not appear in the sequence. But we can, oh, that's data re-uploading. Re so we can, we can, in principle, upload the data twice to our quantum computer. And uh, start to learn. Let me change the parameters somehow. Maybe we'll find a good approximation. This, this one doesn't work well, but. OK, so you can go to this uh, web page and play with this demo, which is very nice. I like it. But it's very limited, of course. Only two, we have two qubits, two data points, and it's not really two data features, uh, and so it's really just a, a toy. If you want to do something more interesting, you can use uh, the Penelay library together with, in this case, sklearn, scikit-learn, a well-known machine learning library. I use scikit-learn here to perform an experiment. I want to show you an experiment, which is basically assessment how a, a given set of hyperparameters works or doesn't work. So what do we import here? Uh, okay, we want in order to, pre, uh, to create batches, I use uh, chain from iter tools. Oh, the, the Iris data set is in sklearn already, so I use Iris from this uh, submodule data set. Uh, I want to shuffle my data, so I use shuffle. This is a scalar, zero to pi. Uh, we want to, of course, divide our data to trace, train test validation uh, subsets. Metrics, accuracy, and uh, yeah, accuracy is the metric we use. And of course, then we want to use uh, uh, penny lane, NumPy wrapped by penny lane, which is basically Autograd the version of NumPy. A couple of templates: angle embedding, which is the angle, uh, uh, our uh, data loading function or data embedding function, which is already implemented in penny lane. Uh, there's this. The, 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 there are these. Um, Strongly entangling layers, so entang entangling layers. There is the initialization function from the, for the entangling layers. And there are a couple of optimizers. In this case, I use gradient descent only. OK, so we load the, the data from uh, scikit-learn. We shuffle the data into x and, of course, data and targets are mapped into x and y's. And we select only two first classes from the data. And here I have an error, there should not be 2. So it should be only 0 to NP pi. So that's an artifact, sorry. So I scale the, the data. Then the, mm, split them into train validation and test, the data and the, the labels with test size 0 0.2. And I'll try, start to define my classifier. So. First of all, we want to know what, what, how many qubits we have, which is the number of features, of course. Um, then we create our device that has the same number of qubits that uh, we have the number of features. We define our circuit consisting of angle embedding, which is data loading, the quantum machine, and uh, strongly entangled layer, which, is this, which are these uh, rotation plus C knots. And of course, we observe expectation value of Pauli Z operator of qubit zero, number zero. Then we define our classifier. So we, we add this value B to our classifier. So our, our classification function is basically uh, the value of this uh, uh, observable plus a bias, a real number. And we define our cost function or construction for calculation, which is basically we apply this uh, variational classifier of, with parameters theta with values from the set x and calculate the mean of uh, differences of, squ uh, the square, uh, of square of the other differences. And that's our cost function or loss, fun loss value. OK, so now. We choose number of layers three. That's a hyperparameter of our network. We once again train, uh, divide into validation. Validation is not important here, but we, it will be used later. 
we map the labels from 0 to minus 1 and from 1 to 1. OK, that's not important, but in order to, be, uh, to have the same language. We choose our batch size of 5. So every step, the, for every step, the cost, of the, uh, the cost function will be calculated for, uh, for 5 uh, samples. We calculate the number of batches. We choose number of epochs, so how many times a given sample will be passed to the, to the training procedure. And we start training. So in order to start training, we um, first of all have some uh, initial thetas, theta weights, which is basically uniform distribution from over 0 to, to 1. We have this our bias 0, as I already told you. We create our, uh, our theta initial. OK, this pass to theta. That's the initial of our parameter. And then we use our gradient descent optimizer or any, kind, any optimizer we want and start the training. So that's basically x batches here is a set of indices of batch index. OK, that's uh, in order that's slightly complicated line that allows, you to, allows us to iterate over batches. That's all. Uh, it took me like a couple of probably hours to find out how to do it well, using chain and enumerate and all this stuff. OK, so now we have a lambda function that depends only on theta, where x and e, or our x's, uh, which are the data from a given batch, and our energies, which are plus minus 1 ener labels from our, uh, from, from our batch are passed to the, this cost function. But of course, we want to vary over theta only. So we create a lambda function. And this lambda function is passed to the optimizer with initial theta and, of course, theta times t. And we get the theta in time t plus 1. And that's the end of the, of the learning loop. And in order to learn whether, you know, to learn and think about useful about this, uh, about uh, this procedure, we first of all uh, calculate the expectation value, so value of our decision function actually. So we use this classifier over theta for excess. So we have this uh, array of uh, uh, labels over, uh, over the test set. Then we transform the, the, the labels to probabilities by just move shifting to up by 1 and divided by 2 because we of course the, the, that's you know a trick that to transform uh, expectation values into probabilities of cat 0 or cat 1 and we can calculate uh, accuracy score or confusion matrix using uh, uh, stick learn um, metrics and basically how you can use your classifier okay that's just an example because first, first of all, we just have here only two classes, which is not so interesting, unfortunately. Uh, because, of course, we, we use qubits. Uh, with qubits, it's better to have only two classes. So it's easier this way. But we can do multi-class classification. And the standard procedure that is uh, being used also, for example, in uh, support vector machines. So. What, how does it work? OK, there are two basic schemes, one versus rest and one versus one. This one is a picture of one versus rest. And uh, so we have two features. It's an artificial set, a new set. Of course, very nice to classify because it's completely separable and it's very easy to separate. But this picture is just shows you how to, how to, how to understand the multi-class uh, multi classification schemes. And we uh, fit a, lin a bunch of linear classifiers to um, sets divided into two parts, one which is uh, positive and one which is negative. Here the positive is this one, and all the other three uh, bubbles are negative. Here, this one is the positive, all the other are negative. So basically, we have this division to positive negative classes, only we choose only one class, and this one class is uh, important for us. The other is negative. And then there are various ways, but uh, we use the standard weight implemented in Escalern to combine this classifier into one 
multi, uh, multi-class classifier. If you want to know the details, read even not the documentation, but the source code of uh, Scanlearn, and it's messy, unfortunately. OK, so this is one scheme. Other is slightly easier, I believe, but uh, has this disadvantage that it uses more it builds more classifiers. So this one uh, divide, uh, only takes two classes, ignores the others. One is becoming ne positive, one is negative, and then we build over all distinct pairs of classes, uh, collection of classifiers, and the structure of this, uh, and all these uh, results of classification are merged in, into one multi-class classifier, which is a one versus one classification scheme. Um, and uh, it is also used in SQLearn, for example, for support vector machines. OK, so in order to, to, to have an experiment and to discuss the class and quality of classification, we perform cross-validation of, uh, of our parameters, or hyperparameters, and we would like to know which of the classifier is the best. So now I'm using the example I presented uh, before, the one that uh, works on Iris, but I use the entire data set, of course. I have three classes now. I built a bunch of, uh, uh, I built a bunch of classifiers, actually three because uh, how it works for three classifiers. In two cases, in one versus one, in one versus rest, I, I, I use different number of layers, number of epochs. No, I know it's not so important. One it should be enough, usually, but here it's 20. I use different number of batch sizes, and I use different uh, optimizers. I don't use the gradient, uh, the, stochastic, the, the gradient, the, the first one, the, the, the stochastic gradient, the, the sand, because it is, uh, I mean, it's too, too easy. And I would like to know which strategy is the best. OK, so I can draw this nice, nice picture and see, OK, now uh, in the columns we have classifiers. In the small columns we have the batch size. And uh, in the rows we have a number of layers. And here we see uh, there is the classification results for 10-fold uh, class, uh, cross-validation. So we divide our data set, entire data set, into two subsets, the, 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 the training validation set and the test set. And of course, for each uh, fold, we have, we choose different test set. And this, uh, uh, then we, we do it uh, 10 times with different training validation test sets, and then calculate the averages in order to learn something useful from, of, from, from, uh, from our, about our classifiers. So what we can see, OK, number of layers is important. The more layers, the better, which is what we expect, basically, because we have, no, we have more parameters. And as usual in statistics, the more parameters we have, the classification results should be better. Um, the method is not so important, as you can see. Um, so the optimization method is not so important. The number of batches is not um, so important either. But what we can see that our results are pretty high. We have averages of uh, 90 something percent. So these classifiers work pretty well. And from some subsets, okay, that's not really important, but for some, from subsets, we had some sets, we have perfect classifiers. And here are the results, the same results by, for the one versus rest classification scheme. OK, so it's not so different. I have a summary here. So the best values we found in our classic cost validation uh, scheme is that number of layers is important. OK, more parameters, better. Batch size can be small. That's fine. Uh, classification uh, quality is 93 plus minus, uh, that's the standard deviation, 0 0.06, which is uh, pretty good, I believe. Um, one versus one in this case was uh, worst, but it's not always the case. I, for, for a different data set I've trained, these results are completely different. And uh, okay, the, the, the choice of the optimizer okay, is important, but we don't really know how to, how to approach it. 
there is a quantum optimizer, or a, the optimizer dedicated to, to this kind of circuits, which I don't really understand yet. It's a new result. I have to learn how it really works. It is called quantum natural gradient optimizer. Um, OK. So that's, we are heading towards the end. Oh, OK, that was pretty hard and hard. But first of all, uh, there is a couple of libraries you can use. The one I was talking about is Xanadu's Penny Lane in Python. And it's nice because it supports, first of all, almost all the simulators and actual devi quantum devices you, you can imagine. So there are plugins for every single simulator I know. I mean, important simulator, at least. And there are plugins for, you can use uh, either uh, Autograd as a simple um, classical neural network interface. Or you can use PyTorch, or you can use TensorFlow. So basically, it covers all, most of the important libraries. There is QuantumFlow that is somehow connected to Rigetti. I don't really understand the connection there, but it uh, seems that Rigetti was in, uh, investing a little bit in this, uh, in this library, which is also nice. Uh, it has some advantages, but it's not as well documented as uh, Xanadu, uh, Xanadu's penny lane. And not, it's not as well developed. And there is the third library, Yao. Yao is in Julia, which I like a lot. Uh, it, is, um, it is a relatively small project, but I believe it is the best of them, of them all because, uh, because it's in Julia. And uh, why? Why? OK. First of all, I mean, there's a couple of conclusions. First of all, Python is too slow. These experiments, in the case of the, of the Irish data set, they were reasonable. I mean, it took like, let's say, three hours on 36 core machine to run it. But it's already challenging. In case of a larger data set of 8,000 samples, it took me six days on six core machine to calculate all of that. On, having only three folds. So it's extremely low. And, the, and of course, the scale of the, quantum, of the simulated quantum machine is only four qubits. Four qubits is not, not difficult to simulate. So that's the uh, problem with Python here. So I'm personally moving to Yao. Yao supports CUDA. And with CUDA and uh, GPU, it might be way faster. The documentation of Yao states that they are two up to three orders of magnitude faster than penny lane in some, some cases. Of course, I mean, another conclusion is that machine learning might be a useful application of quantum computers in the infant state, so in the state we, maybe not we have now, but in some future. And these quantum rational classifiers are interesting area of research, and which I'm going to, I'm following, and I'm, I'm doing now. Uh, OK, I calculated that, OK, because I'm, I don't really sure, but one single um, uh, op application of 1,000 measurements, so a single program run on a, uh, on a qubit, uh, on a quantum IBM Q device, is 20 seconds. So for this experiment, it should be like a year to, to perform on, a, on, a, on, a, on IBM Q device now. So it's not, not, not feasible, unfortunately. Because look, we, we have to for a single for a single step of this optimization, we have to run the forward algorithm, which is easy because it's only for a fixed number of uh, of parameters, uh, fixed parameters, so it's easy. But then we need, in backward propagation, we need to learn for every single parameter, we, we have to run a program twice. So it takes a lot of time, and we do, when you have a, a lot of parameters, it takes a lot of time. And now, fortunately. Current uh, quantum devices are very, very slow. OK, that's the uh, literature which I propose you to look into. First of all, there's this uh, paper by Peter Vitek, actually, not by Amante, but yeah, that's a different story of on quantum machine learning in nature. And there is. Uh, this very nice book, book you can buy or download if you are in have you, if you have a Springer subscription. Basically, every single Polish university 
and the research institution has access to a Springer uh, subscription, so you can just download this book from uh, your, through your institution access. If you want to learn more about uh, circuit, uh, circuit centric quantum classifiers, these two, uh, two um, positions, so Maria Schultz is, 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 is the person to, to learn from. And of course, if you want to learn how to calculate guard, uh, gradients, uh, you have to look at this, uh, this paper in FISREF A, which is pretty well done and uh, which is important. OK, of course, I have this, my, uh, my comic book, probably some of you know about. Uh, so I, uh, it's now available on, online free of charge. You can download it from a um, link I will show later. But now I would like to invite you to a cooperation, if you, if you wish. Uh, for, because, uh, first of all, we would like to make a, a small hackathon in quantum machine learning, if you are interested, just for fun, maybe some, some silly prize, whatever, uh, sometime in the future. Uh, and who would be interested to part in participating in such a hackathon? OK, I have one person, two. OK, so there is a couple. Only? OK, I mean, we have to find time and place, but uh, I don't know, we, we'll find a place and uh, just to learn together. I mean, uh, I don't want really to have any comp competitive uh, spirit there because it's not really important for us. It's to, to learn together something and maybe to do something useful. Second of all, we, we, uh, we plan to, uh, to apply for a unitary fund uh, in order to, f to, to support a student willing to, or a programmer, willing to port some of the parts of Penlane to Yao, Yao JL, because this uh, Yao JL needs help, and with Yao JL we, are, we will be able to do better research faster and to learn more about this kind of algorithms. And uh, we would like to, to build a QML, quantum machine learning demo, with a web, web front end using Julia backend, which would be similar to one we, I've showed you already, but uh, slightly more sophisticated and uh, working with a larger number of qubits, larger, larger data sets. You know, it would be just a demo, but uh, something that would uh, be able to show abilities of quantum machine learning, quantum neural networks. I have open positions for master's student, two pos uh, four positions, actually. I have uh, research assistant positions at AstroSent in this area. And I have uh, postdoc positions, actually. I mean, they might be filled soon, but nevertheless, I can still advertise them. So if you want to learn more, more about AstroSend, what we do in AstroSend, which is basically uh, what I do is uh, to use machine learning, quantum machine learning to look for dark matter particles and uh, to analyze and look for gravitational waves, because we have access to these data. And my colleagues know how, how to do it properly. I don't really know much, but they are there to and to help me. And of course, people at Samka are also working on this subject. So if you want more, take a picture, and we have some positions there, various levels. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, the, the, the comic book, it is here. You can buy it here or download from here for free. That's the copy. That's the physical copy. That's PDF and some information about me. And we have plenty of time for discussion, as far as I understand. Okay, let's let's thank Fiat for this great lecture. And uh, indeed, we have some time for uh, discussion, for questions. Actually, I have some questions. I made some notes, so let me ask the first question. Okay. Uh, so uh, you gave a very interesting example, or several examples of uh, applying this. Uh, quantum neural networks to the classification problem. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know whether it would be uh, easy or difficult to apply to regression problems as well? Uh, it's a good question, and I have very, I mean, uh, I mean, of course you can do it. If you have your regression problem in, uh, basically, in, uh, you, basically you don't use this classifier here. <laughs> you just use the value of your of your decision function as your regression target. So yeah, no problem. I mean, cost function is the same. Because as you can see, 
In this very case, the cost function, sorry, where it is, do I have it? Here. We don't care, I mean, it's predicted is uh, continuous variable, expect, yeah, and expectation are plus minus one, but of course you can, you can put any value you wish between plus and minus one, minus one plus one. Okay, good. Um, have you made any comparison of uh, time of training uh, between those classifier, uh, quantum classifier and classical classifiers for classical yeah. neural networks, for example? Yeah, in as all the classifiers uh, in Secret Learn are way faster, like two orders of magnitude. They're two, three orders of magnitude faster. Basically, they are instantaneous. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Of course, I mean it's a silly, silly example now. I mean it's just for for research. It's not useful at all. Right. Maybe with YAL and CUDA, maybe it will work faster. The problem is with the software, not with the method, because the simulation here is not costly. Mm -hmm. Because this is only four qubits, 16 by 16 matrices, that's fine. Okay. And are there any limitations? Would it be an advantage of using more qubits at, at the current stage? Yeah, okay. Why would you like, okay, first of all, more features, more qubits. Second of all, you can repeat your features on different qubits and then ob uh, obtain non-linear transformations of your data, of your feature vectors. Uh, because as you under well know, if you have, if we have this encoding and we, when we repeat a, a given qubit several times, we have higher order um, polynomials here. So we have non-linear feature transformation. So yes, more qubits might be more interesting because the, the, the feature, then the features become transformed in a nonlinear way, which we usually like in uh, machine learning. But of course, then it can explode because we don't have so much. Then with 20 qubits, we are already very, the matrices are huge, of course. All right, so uh, you showed that we did some experiments, performed some experiments with one, two, or three, uh, three layers uh, of neurons, mm -hmm. I understand. And how many neurons there were per, per layer? And no, no, a layer is okay. uh, this is a single boxy layer. Is a oh, layer. okay, I so, see. So you can have, these are two layers and of course up to three. I did it with up to three All because right. it was slow. Only three because it was very slow. Okay, but, uh, yeah, you showed that uh, with more layers we can achieve better results. Uh, Usually it is usual. the case with, my, my, with, uh, with any single classifier you use because you have more parameters. Yeah, but sometimes it's also more difficult to train, right? Because yes. you need more Yes, but data. in this case, three seems to be a very good number. I had some tests with more, with more layers, but unfortunately, I mean, they were not very good. So it seems that three is good enough, but it's, it's just a random number, I guess, basically. Okay. I don't have any proofs for that. We need better software in order to prove it, at least numerically. All right, good. Okay, I have one more question, but maybe I will also let other people ask questions. Do you have any questions to Piotr? Yeah, there is one, so just, I just wait a second. I will just bring uh, Mike. Uh, hi, Piotr. Uh, thanks for Hi. a nice presentation. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, these were examples of uh, quantum networks uh, classically optimized. Yeah. Uh, are there examples of uh, classical or quantum networks uh, quantum optimized? Classical quantum optimized, yes. And you will see one. You will see one, <laughs> particularly. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, uh, what, what is the status of this? Is uh, it, restricted uh, Boltzmann machines, of course. Restricted Boltzmann machines can be optimized on D-Wave, or in TR in very large unitary computers. But uh, we don't have so many qubits. I mean, like we need about thousand qubits or hundreds of qubits in order to optimize it. So, uh, of course, the, the the gate model based quantum computers are too small to to do it for restricted Boltzmann machines, in any useful sense, but D-Wave is able to help us with uh, restricted Boltzmann machines, as far as we know. So yeah, you can have a different way, different uh, networks. Restricted Boltzmann machines are are different uh, kind of networks, of course, unsupervised. Uh, but yeah, we can do it. So, yes, so 
And quantum, what was the question? What was the other combination? Quantum, quantum. OK, that's different. I don't know. <laughs> quantum optimization of quantum. Yeah, that's. You should ask probably people from Gliwice now, because they work on quantum, quantum machine learning. So quantum data, quantum operations on, uh, on, 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 on the quantum data. But that's different field, subfield. All right. Any more questions to Piotr? I have one more question. Uh, so this is uh, a quite new area. So as you showed more, uh, so all publications are very recent. Uh, they were published several years ago. Um, so how do you expect, can we, can we predict how this area may uh, evolve, how it may develop? Because I also um, have already seen some papers about uh, applications of quantum computers to build quantum guns, quantum reinforcement learning. Um, how do you think, so uh, in, from two uh, sides, I would say, so the first uh, thing is, uh, the first perspective is theoretical perspective, so I mean uh, algorithms, how, those, uh, area, how this area may evolve, and the second thing uh, is, or are applications, or possible applications, because it looks that uh, we are still quite far from uh, real practical applications and improvements of uh, classical methods. Um, yeah, can you can you give some uh, hints based on your experience? Uh, how do you think how uh, how this area may evolve, and in, in which uh, parts of this research is uh, good to focus for people who are, uh, for example, keen to learn more and would like to start the research in this area? Okay, what is the driving force between behind all of this? Is Zanadu now? Zanadu is an, okay, it's one, nice animation, they have a web page. But basically what they do, they do these optical chips. I don't really understand uh, the optical part well enough. My, my understanding of quantum optics is non-existent, almost non-existent. But they are able to prepare single modes uh, or entangled modes on these uh, optical devices that operate in uh, room temperature, and they uh, can measure various uh, features of uh, observables of these uh, of these uh, modes of light of light. So there are single photons. Then they are entangled, as far as we understand, and uh, they believe that this kind of optical devices, single photon devices, might be or single, in the sense multiple photons, but uh, uh, of weak signal devices might be usable in the future. They invest a lot. They get a, they got a lot of money. Uh, so a couple of millions, I believe, for, like, yeah, recently they got $4 million, before they got like $30 million. So this company looks to be, has a, does something interesting. It is high temperature, optical. So it might be very fast and may be useful. We don't know. We don't know whether this entire endeavor of quantum machine learning, at, at least in this approach, is, uh, it, it will be useful at all, because maybe this Maybe, I don't know, the coherence, coherence, or maybe the fact that uh, there are some fundamental algorithmic reasons why this approach would be uh, not so important. So I don't know. But uh, I know that uh, in close future, people will be still working on this subject. And I like it a lot because um, it allows us to, to do something uh, with the data, with, with machine learning, to learn more about quantum computation. And this entire at least I see the entire sea of possibilities, what we have to look into. How to design, for example, these uh, circuits. How to map these circuits onto um, existing devices. Because we can implement these circuits on Rigettis, on IBM Qs, on, on, on future Intel processors, or, or Google processors. So um, that's a question from the engineering point of view. Can we do anything? Uh, show that anything useful can be done using these devices, and at least have a hope that these results will be somehow better than, uh, than classical results, somehow. One interesting idea is, is this uh, encoding. If we can encode tens of thousands of data just on a couple of qubits, then that's become, it is becomes uh, interesting, because we have a single sample consisting of uh, thousands of variables, 
and we encode them on a couple of dozens of qubits. That's interesting, but unfortunately, we don't know how to encode it efficiently, in the sense that our circuits are very long. We need a lot of uh, entanglement and a lot of uh, entangling gates in order to achieve this encoding. So here is an active area of research, as far as I know. People look into it. And that is a hope for, if we achieve this, uh, if we find how to encode the data, how to put the data onto a quantum machine, then this, this entire endeavor is, uh, is very interesting, because we can have huge amounts of data on, on the quantum de device being processed uh, simultaneously in a maybe useful way. OK, uh, there's one more question. Uh, first of all, thanks for making this presentation as accessible as you could. Um, this question may be a, um, a bit long, so I apologize in advance. But uh, you blamed uh, <clears throat> Pendeline's uh, low performance compared to Yao to Python because mm -hmm. of, of its l way lower performance than Julia. Um, mm -hmm. But I believe, I, of course, I haven't taken a look on, on Penelain, and I wanted to ask mm -hmm. if you did, because I believe it, if Penelain was well designed, it would only use Python as a control layer and pass the compute heavy part to a low level mm -hmm. kernel, let's say so. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So the Python low performance shouldn't matter. No, it, it, it doesn't matter. Why? That's the exact problem with Python. The problem is that for an exa uh, experiment, we, I need like five million calls to a quantum device. And these five million calls pass through this entire stack of functions that are Python functions that have to be, call that have to be called. They cannot be optimized out from the code because Python is dumb. Python just executes what, what it is thought to, to execute. It doesn't optimize the code. That's the exact problem. The number of times I have to repeat this entire stack of computation causes this, uh, this, uh, this entire process to be, to be very slow. And that's the problem with Python, that it's a glue language here. Why Julia is more, more interesting here? Because it can optimize, it can remove all these calls. I can do, transform this, all these functions into inline functions and do it on a, uh, on a GPU all the time for all the, all the all this entire and this entire process can be done on GPU and possibly even parallelize somehow. So no, this is a problem with uh, uh, in Python. I believe I did a lot of Monte Carlo in my past in in Python, and it was extremely slow. Julia gave me a uh, hundred times uh, speed up, speed, had speed up hundred times from Python. So I moved from a cluster computer to a desktop computer just by using Julia many years ago. And we know from the test from Yao JL, they can, I can show you the, the, the stats import interesting. Let, let me look for Yao JL. They have very nice uh, um, plots of efficiency, I believe. Uh, if I want to find it quickly, I'll just uh, skip it. But yeah, there, there is like, oh, there's, there are benchmark here, benchmarks here. So you can see, at, look at benchmarks. Uh, so you have different uh, backends here and different procedures. So those are just single gates. But nevertheless, you can see that overhead coming from Python here is huge. It drops if you have larger systems, of course, because then the problem is with the time of uh, computation time of, 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 uh, of our simulator, of quantum simulator. But overhead at the beginning, up to let's say 10 qubits is huge, 10 to the power of three here. So yeah, I, I believe Julia with Yao should be way faster to the point that uh, things that are unfeasible now, like for example, um, uh, reinforcement learning with uh, these circuits might be feasible in Julia than, rather than in, in, in Python. So, yeah, I, I blame Python here. I like Python a little bit at least, but I blame Python here. And this entire, st and this entire idea that we develop quantum software in Python is silly, in my opinion. 
Python is not, it's not good um, high uh, performance computing language, unfortunately. Okay, uh, you told us about Xanadu, which is a company behind Penelane, mm -hmm. and how about Yao? Because I saw that there is a GitHub repository. Is it an open source project? Yeah, yeah of course, it, it's, it's MIT, it's done on MIT. Who's this guy? Where is this guy? Mm. There's one single guy that works on this, uh, on this subject, I believe. Uh, Quantum PFS. I don't know who is. Yeah, this guy. Who's there? So he's, he's to blame, and he's from Waterloo now. Okay. I believe he was in, uh, in MIT. Also, also Canada. Yeah, yeah. Canada, right. of course. Okay. And more questions to Piotr? If not, then let's thank once again Piotr for this great lecture and answering questions. Uh, so the next meeting is already scheduled and Professor Grzegorz Kasprowicz from Warsaw University of Technology will tell us about uh, open source stack for quantum computing and the lecture will be on 27th of February. So Grzegorz, do you want to uh, tell something now to want to announce or advertise the event? Okay. Uh, so it's me. I'm next. I'm going to give a talk. We are trying to build a quantum computer, uh, not the physical part, but the part of electronics, the control system. So we are building all the electronics for Oxford startup at the moment. So. It's going to be very, very cool stuff in the next coming months. Okay. Sounds, sounds very interesting. So I hope that uh, we'll also have such a large audience. Um, all right. Uh, recently, we founded Quantum AI Foundation. It's a new charity organization which will help us, hopefully will help uh, organize this event and in the future maybe also some other events, hackathons, workshops. Um, if you want and if you can support us then that may be very helpful so that we can organize better and, uh, and better events. So uh, feel free to contact us if you are interested. And also let's, let's stay in touch, uh, join our Facebook groups, our YouTube channel, our mailing list. Uh, recently we also I created a Twitter profile uh, of Warsaw Quantum Computing Group, so uh, you can also find us on, on Twitter. Thank you once again for your attention, thanks for coming, and I hope to see you uh, next time in February on our next meeting. Thanks once again.